Over the course of his career, William Shakespeare, the great playwright, wrote over 30 different plays, including such famous plays as Hamlet, Julius Caesar, Macbeth, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and, of course, Romeo and Juliet. But in 1599, he wrote a, a play entitled uh, As, uh, As It Does. And, it, and in this play, he wrote some famous lines. And the lines went like this. All the world's a stage. All men and women are merely players. They have their entrances and they have their exits. And one man in his time plays many parts. All the world's a stage. All men and women are merely players, and they have their entrances, exits, and one man in his time plays many parts. That's an interesting idea. It's interesting to stop and think about our lives as being kind of like a, a story that somebody might watch, like a, a Hollywood movie or maybe a famous Broadway play. So if your life was a Hollywood script, and we were to watch your life, I wonder what that play or that movie might look like. Who would play you in your own story? I think about my own life, and I think, well, I would probably like it if uh, maybe Han Solo, you know, Harrison Ford, if he would play me within my movie, uh, but it'd probably be somebody like uh, Jonathan Hedder, um, Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> so who would play you, Right? Who would play you within your story, and what would happen? What would take place? What would the plot be? What would we learn from your story? What would happen as you grew up? What would we notice? Maybe we would see uh, things taking place within your life, like the, the time in which you were in high school and you first fell in love. Maybe you found your high school sweetheart, who eventually became your, your husband or your wife. Or maybe we'd see the time in your life in which you went to college and you began to study and you, you discovered for the very first time the career that you wanted and so you began to pursue that and it was an incredible moment. Maybe we would see other amazing highs within your life like uh, the moment when you found out that you were first pregnant. Or maybe we would see some incredible lows like the time in your life in which you found out that you had just lost your best friend. What would we see? What would happen? What would take place if your life was a script? And it was being played out and people were able to watch it. And would you be cast as a, a hero or a, a villain? Would you be an example that we'd want to follow? Or would your story look very, very differently? I want us to think about that this morning. I want you to think about your life in terms of a play. I want you to think about the world kind of stepping back and watching your life as it begins to unfold. And as you think about your story, I want us to examine another story. Because if it's true that all the world's a stage, and if it's true that we step out onto that stage and we're here for a short period of time, and we enter stage left, and someday we're going to exit stage right, then in that period of time, as we're on this stage, we need to think about our lives. We need to think about how we live our lives. And we need to stop and consider whether or not we are, what we are contributing to this world that we live within. And so I want us to do that today as we continue within this story found in the book of Acts. Today we continue within our series entitled Acts, Set on Fire and Sent on Mission. And this is a, uh, a series of messages in which we're, we're kind of watching things unfold, just like we would be watching a play. And so in the very beginning of the book of Acts, if you will recall, we began to, to take notice of certain things. In Acts chapter 1, we saw the coming of the Holy Spirit and the promise that Jesus gave to his disciples. A day in which he said, hey, I want to, to you to know that there's going to come a day in which the Holy Spirit is going to come. And we watched that unfold. Acts chapter 2, what happens? The Holy Spirit begins to come. And on the day of Pentecost, we saw tongues of fire beginning to, to fall on the heads of, of various followers of Jesus. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit was being poured out upon God's people, upon his servants. 
Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and began to preach. And he began to proclaim. And as he did so, uh, 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus. And then immediately following that, this community begins to form. A community like no other. In which the Holy Spirit was indwelling within all of the people that were there. And they began to love each other and serve one another and operate within those gifts. And amazing things began to take place. And then last week we saw an incredible miracle. We learned how some of the apostles had been given gifts of, of the miraculous, and they were able to do things. And in Acts chapter 2, we talked about how they were given a sign, they were doing signs and miracles and wonders. And then last week, we talked about a specific miracle that took place in Acts chapter 3 in verses 1 through 10. Peter and John are headed to the temple. And on their way to the temple, they begin to, to notice something, and they, they see a man who was a lame man, a, a lame beggar. And through this conversation that took place and the miracle that ensued, this man was able to receive an ability to walk. And it was an incredible miracle. And immediately following that, in verses 11 through 26, what we see is that Peter continues to preach. He begins, continues to, to proclaim the good news of Jesus to all who will listen. And as he does so, he begins to speak hard truth into the lives of the crowd that has gathered. He talks about how he was able to perform that miracle, and it was through the power of the name of Jesus. And last week we talked about how there is power in the name of Jesus, power to bring healing into our lives. And this is what is happening. This is what is unfolding. This is what's taking place as we get to Acts chapter 4. And so today we're going to examine three different scenes. Scenes that begins to take place. And I want us to see this, this, uh, this story as if we're watching it, as if we are watching a play. And it begins to unfold before our very eyes. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me there to the book of Acts, chapter 4. And today we're going to be in verses 1 through 22. And if you'd like to follow along in those black Bibles, we're going to be on page 911. And also if you'd like to follow along with us online, you can do so by going to your fountain. The dot info. You can click on the, the menu and then click on the learn link and there you'll find today's passage of scripture. But we're going to jump right into this story. We're going to examine the first scene. So let's see what happens in Acts chapter 4 uh, beginning in verse 1. Where we read this. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. All right, let's stop here for just a moment. Time for an intermission. Maybe some of us need to use the restroom. Maybe you need to go get some popcorn. No, 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 I'm just kidding. Time for an intermission. Let's stop and think about this first scene. We might call it Act 1, the arrest. Because in this scene, we see Peter and John speaking to the people, and a number of people are giving their lives to Jesus. In fact, verse 4 tells us what? That the number had grown to 5,000. That's an important number. Luke is marking that for us. Because, if you remember, at the, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus. And so now that number has grown to 5,000. Pretty incredible. And so many, many people are believing, and they're listening to the message of Peter. And Peter was proclaiming the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. But not everybody was happy about that, right? Some of them were annoyed. Some of them were agitated. Some of them were uh, angry with what was being said, and so they wanted to arrest Peter. Why? Because some of them were Sadducees. Did you see that? Sadducees were a group of religious leaders who were Jewish, and they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so this is a group of people who said, this is not true. Why is Peter saying these things? He's putting, planting all these seeds of, into the, in the minds of these people listening. This has got to stop. And so they grabbed Peter and John, and that's why they arrested him. They arrested them, and they kept them overnight. All right, scene number two. Let's continue within this story. 
Verse 5. We read this. That on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Stop here for just a moment. Whoa. (laughs) What is going on here? We might simply call this second scene, Act 2, the accusation. Because there's an accusation that's being brought in front of Peter and John, and a conversation begins to ensue. Notice the details that Luke gives to us. First of all, there was a man by the name of Annas, right? He was the high priest, as well as all of the priestly family. And so all of these religious leaders are gathering before Peter and John. And they come before him, and they basically say this, right? They say, listen, listen, listen. All right, all right, we know what happened yesterday, but give us the inside scoop here. Let me hear, what what is the magic trick? What did you do? We know you can't do that, but what happened? What did you do? You did something. We don't don't know. It was pretty pretty impressive. But what did you do yesterday? Peter and John then turns to them and say these words, right? Wait a minute. If we're being put on trial for what we did, a kind deed done to this man who stands before you healed, then okay, here's what it is. You want to know the power? You want to know the name by which this man was healed? Here it is. It's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's the name. That's the name that has healed this man. You think that that's that's impressive? Oh, no, no, no. It's not impressive to to, to heal a man. This is a man, Jesus, who was raised up from the dead. It's also the one whom you have rejected, whom you have turned away from. And yet God has spoken and God has sent him, and there is no other name given under heaven and on earth by which men must be saved. And that means that all of you, Peter was saying, all of you who are of the priestly family, you must turn to him too. Whoa. <laughs> uh, Peter, what is going on there? This is at the point where we grab our, you know, our programs and say, wait a minute, who's playing Peter? This guy, uh, he's been, uh, he woke up on the wrong side of the bed. He's been drinking too much coffee. What, what's going on here? Who is this guy, Peter? You can't say that, Peter. Peter, come on now. You know you can't make a claim like that. Even in your day, Peter, there were lots and lots of people who believed lots and lots of different things. You can't say there's only one way. There's only one way to God. It's only Jesus, Peter. Come on. I want us to stop and think about this. I want us to stop and think about this very important statement. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 is a very, very important statement. Because even today, we know that right there are millions and millions of people who who think differently. In our world, there are millions and millions of people who practice different religions, world religions. For example, we know that there are 2.1 billion Christians, but there are 1.5 billion Muslims. That means that they believe and, and they follow a, 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 and worship Allah. And so they follow and practice in a, a, a religion called Islam, right? And Muslims don't believe that, that, that you come to God, to Allah, through Jesus. They believe that he was just simply a, a, a normal prophet. No, no, you need to listen to another prophet, a, a guy by the name of Muhammad. He's the one that you need to listen to. 
And so they would have a very different answer, and they would not agree with Peter in this moment. 1.1 billion people in the world are atheists. That means that they believe that there is no God. And so they would have a very different approach to this idea of salvation. They would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's, no, there's not even a God, and so if there's not a God, there's no way to get to him. There's no, there's no person you even need to know. Very different answer. There are 900 million Hindus. Hindus have a very different uh, approach and a belief in the afterlife, right? They believe in something called karma. Karma means that if you do good certain things within your life, that, that you'll earn certain credit. And then, you know, if, if you do bad things, it's bad karma. And so if you don't do enough good things, then you need to be reincarnated. You'll come back as something else, and then you'll go through this cycle, and eventually you can break that cycle. And if so, you can receive eternal life. But there is no person. You don't need a certain name. You just need to do certain things, good works. Hmm. There are 375 million Buddhists. Buddhists believe in a very different, uh, have a very different view of salvation as well. They believe in something called nirvana in which you can reach, and so you can work your way to this particular place, and they don't believe in a personal God, and they don't believe in a way that you have to, to follow in this particular way. They believe in many, many gods. There are 16 million Mormons. Across the world. Mormons take a very different belief as well. They believe in the teachings of a man by the name of Joseph Smith, who wrote the Book of Mormon. And they believe that this man is, is a true prophet from God and that he has the one who has given them certain knowledge and, and that, that Jesus himself was he was not the God, he was just another God. Very different belief. Jehovah's Witnesses. There are 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses. And the Jehovah's Witnesses, they take a view that says that Jesus is a created God. He's a lesser God. And so there's Jehovah, and then he created this other God named Jesus, and so that's a very different view as well. And finally, Jews. There are 14 million Jews. Orthodox Jews. Men and women who believe that the Messiah is still to come. Messianic age is still in the future. It's coming, it's coming, but it's not here. And so as a result, they would say, no, 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 Peter, you're wrong. Peter, you don't understand. And so millions and millions and millions of people all across our world would say, Peter, you're wrong. You've come to the wrong conclusion. You've, come, you've assessed this thing all wrong. It is not true. There is not just one name. And yet Peter would say, no, no, no. There is one name by which we all must be saved. And that's why Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 is a huge statement for the gospel. It's a huge statement for us as Christians because it's a statement of exclusivity. It says that there is only one name by which all all men are saved. And it's huge. And the words that Peter spoke in this moment were huge. They were massive. It was incredible. And as a result, we need to remember that. We need to understand that this is a statement that we either believe or we don't. And all of us this morning, we need to have that in our mind. We need to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 true or not? Because it changes everything. And Peter's message in this moment was significant. And we need to wrestle with that as well. All right, third scene. Third scene in our story. It begins at verse 13. Notice what happens. How this story uh, comes to a close. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evidence to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But in order that it may not spread or spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. 
But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Final scene, final act. Act number three could simply be called the amazement. Because the people were amazed at what had happened, and so were those Jewish religious leaders. They were astonished, they were amazed. These are untrained, unschooled, uneducated, common, ordinary men. They're fishermen. Where did they get this power? How are they able to say the words that they are? Where does this come from? And so they kind of gather together. Did you notice that? I kind of picture this as like one of those holy huddles, right? So they, they come together, and they're like, listen, listen, hold on, Peter, just one second. Okay, guys, come here, come here for a second. What are we going to do about that? <laughs> I mean, Peter, it's clearly he did this miracle. Clearly he has, has, has done these things. But we, we've got to, to think about what are we going to do? We can't deny that it happened, and yet he continues to preach the name of Jesus. I know what we'll do. We'll just tell him to stop it. We'll tell him he has to stop speaking in that name. And so they come back and they speak to him and they say that, those words to him. And what does he say in return? Whether or not it's right for me to, to follow you or God, you determine that. But we can't help but speak of what we have seen and heard. Peter, this is the man who had seen the risen Christ. This is the man who had walked and talked with him. This is the man who had shaken the hand of a man who was dead but is now alive. He says, listen, I can't help but speak of the things that I have seen and heard. And all who heard those things were amazed, including those religious leaders that had to take a step back and say, wow, what is going on? What is taking place? And as you and I stop and we think about this, We need to see that what um, William Shakespeare would say 1,500 years later is true. That all the world is a stage. And all the men and women are are merely players. We we have our entrances and we have our exits. and, And one man plays many parts. And Peter in this moment is being raised up to a place in which the spotlight is being shown on him. And he's able to to declare this truth to the most important religious leaders of the day. The Jewish religious leaders. Incredible. And that speaks to all of us. Because this is a picture of the gospel. This is what happens in all of our lives. God steps into your life and into mine. He saves us through the blood of Jesus. And then he pours out his spirit into our lives. And we receive that spirit into our lives. And then he raises us up so that we might be placed on a stage and might proclaim the good news of Jesus to all who will hear. And what happened in the life of Peter is what should be happening in all of our lives. That's what God wants to do with all of us. He wants us to see that the time we have on this earth is short. We might enter stage left. We might have the spotlight for a time. But very soon we're going to exit stage right. And when that happens, we will come face to face with our Lord and Savior. And when that takes place... We want to know that we have followed him. We have spoken his name. We have proclaimed the good news so that all might hear and all might believe. And that's why Peter would go on to later write what he wrote. Do you remember 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15? What did he say in that moment? He said, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is within you. Always be prepared. Peter was prepared on the day of Pentecost. Peter was prepared on the day in which he healed that man. Peter was prepared as he stood before those Jewish religious leaders and boldly said, there is one name by which all men must be saved. Peter was prepared. Are we, though? Are you and I? Do we understand that our lives are here one day and gone the next? Do we understand that God is raising us up and placing us onto a pedestal, a stage, so that the world might see us? 
Do we understand that we are called to be the light of the world, city on a hill, the bride of Christ? This, and, and the world needs to see our light shine so that others might praise our Heavenly Father, right? The Bible tells us these things. And so that's a truth that God is saying, listen, I'm trying to raise you up so that people can see you, and you can use that platform, not to bring glory to yourself, but to me, to proclaim the name of Jesus so that all may know, all may hear, all may believe. And so as we stop and we think about these truths, I think there's a sense in which all of us needs to, to view our lives in a little bit different way. We need to see what God has done for us in Jesus, and we need to kind of see our, our lives as an actor or an actress would see themselves. It's a part of an unfolding story. It's a part of a, of a play that is taking place on the world stage. So how can we do that? I want to think about that in those terms, and I want us to think about what Peter did, what we can learn from him. So here's three steps that I believe we need to take, and the first is this. Know your cues. Know your cues. A good actor, a good actress, they know their cues. When certain things happen, they know that they need to do other things, right, to say certain words, lines within that play or within that movie. Peter knew his cues. When he was asked the question, by what name, there's one, by what power, there's one, those were cues. How did you do this, Peter? He took that and he launched into a message which spoke to them and answered that very question, right? And we need to do the same. Throughout our lives, as people ask us questions, they're giving us cues, and we need to be ready to, to give an answer for the hope that is within us. And so if somebody comes to us and they begin to, to talk to us and they, they tell us about uh, their favorite uh, sport, we ought to tell them about our coach. If they tell us about where they work, we ought to tell them about our boss. If they tell us about, uh, you know, the, about something going on within the, the health issues and things going on within their lives, we ought to tell them about our physician. If they tell us about the problems in the world and all the things that are happening, we ought to talk to them about our Lord and Savior, the one who, who has suffered and died for the sins of the world, Right? When people speak into our lives, they give to us cues. They give to us opportunities. And whether or not we choose to speak into their lives in those moments is on us. And so know your cues and point people to Jesus. Second, rehearse your lines. Peter was prepared. He knew what to say. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Always be prepared. Peter was prepared. And the same thing is true for actors and actresses. As they prepare for a certain role, right, they need to internalize the things that they're going to say. And you and I need to be able to do the same as well. This is our script, right? This is what God has given to us. And the more that God begins to, to speak into our lives, and the more that we begin to, to read his word and understand what he is saying within the pages of the Bible, the more that the Holy Spirit can bring to our mind and to our attention in those moments in which we need to speak up, right? And so we got to know our, our script. I read an interesting uh, article about Anthony Hopkins. You know who Anthony Hopkins is? He's a, he's a great actor, and uh, he's been in a lot of great films, uh, films like Mission Impossible and Silence of the Lambs. Remember, he was Hannibal Lecter, and then he was in um, uh, Thor recently, and he was in lots of different films, and he's been uh, doing TV and films th since the mid-1960s. But in an interview, he once said that when he prepares for a role, he will read his script between 100 and 200 times. Think about that. 100 and 200 times. He'll read that and read that and read that and read that. Why? Why does he do that? He said that he does, he does that in order to internalize that script. In order to allow that to come into his life, in order that he can feel what that character felt and can speak as though he is that particular character and he can kind of live that out. He needs to kind of dwell within that and live within that before he goes and performs what is that speaking to our lives? As we stop and we think about what God has given to us in our script, 
and how we are called to read and reread and reread and reread, this comes alive as it comes into our heart and mind. And as it does so, it prepares us for the stage of life when we go out and we're able to speak truth into the lives of people who are around us. But we have to know our script. We have to rehearse our lines. We've got to know what this says. Third step. We need to then live out our role. So live your role. When you stop and you think about what actors and actresses do, we need to, to realize that many times they'll go to great lengths to live out their role. Sometimes they'll cut their hair or grow their hair out. Sometimes they'll gain weight or they'll lose weight. Sometimes they will go overseas or go somewhere into a culture maybe, and they will spend time, maybe months, preparing for a certain role, reading and studying and learning and just kind of getting involved in, in whatever it is that they need to, to do, right? Same thing is true for, for us. Peter lived out his, his role. He knew that God was raising him up for a particular time. He knew that the spotlight was on him, and he had to come through. He had to speak into the heart and minds of those Jewish religious leaders, and in that moment, he did so. And you and I need to do the same. We have to be genuine. We cannot be fake. Jesus warned uh, that some of the religious leaders were phonies. They were fakes. They were hypocrites, right? They were like actors in the sense that they put on a mask, and they were pretending to be someone that they were not. We are not called to be that. We are called to be genuine. But in the midst of that, we've got to live out our part, our role on the world's stage. We're all called to play a certain part and a certain role. And this is what... We're called to do. We're called to live out that role that God has given to, to us, and it's unique. All of us have been given a different part and a different role. And we need to learn to live that out, and to live it out like Stephen Baldwin has done. Do you know who Stephen Baldwin is? Stephen Baldwin is an interesting guy. He became kind of famous in 1995 for a film that he was a part of called The Usual Suspects. And over the years, he begins to, to, to um, participate and be a part of lots and lots of different films. But I don't know if you know this, but Stephen Baldwin has given his life to Jesus Christ. In 2006, he wrote a book called The Usual Suspect, singular, in which he talked about this. And he talked about what it was like to live in Hollywood and what it was like to, to deal with all the different things in which he was pursuing. And yet, he talked about the steps that he took in order to receive Jesus Christ as Lord. He's gone on to do some pretty amazing things. He started at least three different ministries. He became a youth minister for a while. And he talked about how he was just, uh, he, he loves uh, the young, young people, and he wanted to help them to understand the things of God and the Spirit of God, things he didn't understand growing up. Even more recently, he participated in a film about the thief on the cross just last year. And all of this is to say that here we have a man who is an actor who's living in Hollywood, very difficult place to, to, to be as a, as a follower of Jesus, and the spotlight is on him through all the things that he says, all the things that he does, and he's beginning to use that well for Jesus. And what a picture that is for us. What a picture it is for all of us. Because if it's true that all the world's a stage, and if it's true that all men and women play certain parts, and that they, they have their entrances and they have their exits, and that one man can play multiple parts throughout his lifetime, if those things are true, then it is also true that when God saves you, and God saves me, and God pours out his spirit, and God places us upon a stage, a platform, for the world to see that we need to use that well. We need to follow in his example. We need to be able to speak truth to all who will hear. And God is calling us to do that. And so this morning, as we stop and we consider what is taking place within this, this passage of Scripture, and we see this life of this man named Peter, and how he spoke so boldly and he spoke so confidently to those religious leaders and said, there is no other name. We need to recognize that as a picture of how we need to be and what God has called us to do in Jesus. And so if we wrap all of these truths up, I think we can summarize it in this way. Take the stage and show the world your Savior. God is calling you and me 
to take this stage called the world, to step out and allow his light to shine upon us and to seek, speak boldly for Jesus so that all may hear and all may know and all may believe. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, God, as we come before you this morning, we just pause in this moment and we think about the life of Peter and John. Lord, all of us at some level can relate to these two guys. They were normal, everyday, common men. And yet when they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, they were able to speak to the most powerful men in the Jewish society. They would go on to do even more incredible things, not because of who they were, but because of who you are and how you had empowered them with your spirit. And yet within this room, Lord, are many, many Peters and Johns, men and women who who are called to do the very same. And, And Father, help us to see that. Help us to realize that we exist on a stage for a short time, here one day, gone tomorrow. But help us to understand and to remember that while we still have life, while we can still breathe, that we need to use the spotlight that we've been given in order to speak into the lives of so many people around us and so much darkness that we see so that it would be confronted and exposed by Jesus. And so God, help us to do that as your people. We love you and we praise you and we thank you this day. We pray all these things in the name that is above all name the name that is the one by which all are saved, Jesus.